morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord. I sure hope it is well with your souls today. A few announcements. Uh, don't forget VBS is coming up. And so um, I'd, I'd really appreciate it. And I know the children would appreciate it if you would consider maybe helping with VBS, uh, whether it be, you know, uh, deeply involved as a teacher or, you know, someone who helps the kids get around or just being hands and, you know, feet and eyes and ears keeping them corralled. Um, also, you know, we need help preparing snacks. We need help doing crafts. Or it could be just set up or tear down. So, you know, if God places it on your heart, please let Kylie know. But that's coming up, and we're, we're expecting more kids this year than we had last year, so we, we pray that goes well. Also, um, the youth group, they're still collecting pennies. They're still doing their penny wars until the end of the school year, which is this coming week. So you have one more week to throw more pennies into that as they strive to reach a goal of $9,000 to dig wells in Africa. Um, also, out here in Heritage Hall in the Curio Cabinet, there is a, uh, a military memorabilia display um, celebrating Memorial Day, and we have Chalmer to thank for that, and Dave Young, and some of the other members on the um, archives committee. And so, you know, as you go past there or go over for cookies and coffee, just stop and take a look at it. And we thank you, Chalmer. Other than that, that's, you know, I don't have any other announcements for you, and therefore, my friends, let us begin worship in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I invite you to stand if you're able to join me in our choral call to worship. Just you worship 
may be seated. Today, we are in the midst of Memorial Day weekend, and therefore, I think it only proper that we take a moment to remember those who made sacrifices um, and are no longer with us. But they, they sacrificed many things that we may have the freedoms that we enjoy today. And so would you just bow your head and have a moment to honor their sacrifice. Gracious God, while we are in the midst of this Memorial Day weekend, we wish to take time to remember and give thanks for those who gave of themselves in the service of our country. Lord, we know that when there was threat, when there was a need, they were the ones who, who volunteered, they were the ones who bravely entered into war and did their duty to defend the freedoms that we have today and to win those same freedoms for others who could not defend themselves. We pray that, well, Lord, we, you yourself taught us that no love is greater than that which gives itself for others. Some of these honored dead gave their most precious gift, life itself, but all sacrificed. They sacrificed their youth, they sacrificed their innocence, they sacrificed their dreams, and they sacrificed family, and they sacrificed for us. So help us to honor them and their memory by caring for their family members that have been left behind. Help us to honor their memory by ensuring that the wounded soldier is properly cared for. Help us to honor their memory by being, making sure that the freedoms for which they sacrificed are, are kept. And Lord, help us to honor their memory by demanding that no other young people would follow them into war or the grave unless the reason is worthy and the cause is just. Great Spirit, help us to remember that freedom is not free, and there are times when its cost is incredibly high. Never let us forget those who paid the price to ensure the freedoms that we have. Though their names may fade with the passing of time, Lord, we pray that we will never forget what they have done. We pray that you help us to be worthy of their sacrifice. Amen. And now that we have remembered, honored our military personnel, let us stand and let us honor God and give God thanks for this country that we live in.
seated. And would you join me in the prayer of the day? O oh Lord, may nothing come between you and us today. Help us to choose only your way, so that each step will lead us closer to you. Let your word be a light unto our path, that we may walk the straight and narrow way. Amen. Trust the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. So do not fear, for God is with you. Do not be dismayed, for he is your Lord. And now let us pray the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And glory forever. Amen. As we prepare to receive offering this morning, may you consider not just your monetary gift, but the gifts that God has given you, the gifts of the Spirit and your talents, as you may use them for the ministry of God's kingdom.
please pray with me. Gracious God, I dedicate these gifts to your kingdom work and my life to you as a living sacrifice, bringing all my actions under the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, come and fill your temple. You may be seated. And will you join me in our prayer hymn found in the faith we sing? Lord, as we gather here today, we thank you for many things. We thank you for the freedoms that we have. We thank you for the men and women who have served to preserve these, these freedoms. And we thank you for the men and women who are on the front lines right now and those who are striving to bring peace in other places in the world. Lord, we have so much to be thankful for. And if we were to take the time here this morning just to just keep naming them, we would be here all night. And as with as many things as we give you thanks for, we probably ask for twice as many things. And Lord, in our asking, we're not always as, as gracious. We're often, you know, in need and, and, and desperate in those needs. And so, Lord, we ask and we ask. Lord, we pray that in all the things we ask that you would help us to understand that it's in your time that these things come to us. You have promised that you hear us. And Lord, some of the things we ask for aren't, they're not good for us. And as a good parent, you say no. Other things, Lord, certain people may have to be placed in our lives. Maybe we're not ready for that that thing we're asking for yet or maybe you have other plans but help us Lord to have faith that all things are in your perfect time and that you make all things possible in your time and that you do just what you say in your time may we persevere in our prayers and, and when, when those prayers are answered may we give testimony let me tell you what God has done for me. Let me show you what God has done for me. Lord, help us to be faithful in our prayer and in our testimony. Amen.
Can we just sit in that just a little bit? Just sit and let that echo. Will you please join me in our prayer of illumination? Holy Spirit, you were graciously sent to us to guide us, to inspire us, and to remind us of all our Lord has taught us. Open our hearts and fill us with your wisdom and faith that we may share it with the world. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the letter from 1 Peter chapter 3. Peter says, Who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear and do not be intimidated. But in your heart, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. And from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, Jesus said, If the world hates you, be aware that it hated me before it hated you. If you belong to the world, the world would love you as its own, because you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore the world hate you. Remember the word that I said to you, servants are not greater than their master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But they will do all these things to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Many of us read our Bibles. We read them for morning devotions. We read them for encouragement. We read them for strength and comfort in times of need and sorrow. But there are certain books that we we often choose not to to open, to not do our devotionals in. And 1 Peter is an example of that. I mean, how many of you turn to 1 Peter on a regular basis? Yeah. How many of you have even been in 1 Peter in the past year? Right. And, and there, I mean, there are just certain books we don't go to very often, if, if at all. And I think one of the reasons is, is because we, we have a hard time relating to the information that is, that is being discussed there. Uh, in a very real sense, when we read an epistle, and the word epistle means a letter, we are reading someone else's mail. And, and so, you know, Peter, he, first Peter was written to a specific group of people at a p- particular time in history and for a purpose. <clears throat> it doesn't mean that we can't learn from it or that it's irrelevant to us. Um, God's word is alive. And so there's always relevance. There's always something for us to take from it. However, we might have to dig a little bit. We might have to do our homework to find that relevance. The book of 1 Peter was written in 62 AD to Christians who were scattered throughout Asia and northern Africa. And this was due to Roman persecution. Christians were suffering at the hands of government officials, their employers, their neighbors, even own family members were turning uh, them in. And so Peter writes this letter to encourage them in their faith and to explain how a Christian should should approach this persecution, how they should deal with their suffering. 
Today is Memorial Day, a day we remember those who fought and died to protect the freedoms that we enjoy. And, and one in particular is this one we're, we're using right now, the right to religion, the right to worship the way we want to. But we living here in America don't usually face persecution. We don't usually get punished or suffer because we came to church. We might, you know, be made fun of. We might somewhat be discriminated against in the workplace or on a sports team or something. But usually there's no violence or harm involved in that. However, it can happen in America. And, and there are churches that are, are being burnt down. There are attacks in churches. Some of you might remember, you know, years ago, the Littleton, Colorado mass shooting where Rachel Scott and Cassie Burnell on two different occasions were asked, you know, do you believe in God? And when they said yes, they were shot right there. So it can happen here in the United States. But, but for most of us, we have not, we've not experienced that side of, of worshiping God, the persecution. And because of that, it may be hard for us to relate to what Peter is talking about in his letter. But this letter written 2,000 years ago is very relevant and very well understood by millions of Christians around the world today who are experiencing persecution because they simply choose to believe in Jesus Christ. I want to share a story from a book called Jesus Freaks. By, it was produced by the Christian band DC Talk. And a lot of this information comes from Fox's Book of Martyrs. Um, but this is, this is about a story about a pastor in China. His name is Pastor Li. And Pastor Li, he has, he has vowed that he will not stop preaching and sharing the word of God, even, you know, if he's in prison. But he says here, it says, during the, the period from October 2000 to May 2001, Pastor Lee was arrested 15 times for preaching in his unregistered house church in China. He has been arrested so many times during the past two years that he has lost count. During one recent detention, jailers tied his arms and legs together and chained his arms and legs to a bedpost for three days. When they had finally released him, he was forced to work on an assembly line in the prison factory, putting bulbs into strings of Christmas lights to be sent to America. He and the others had a quota of between four and 5,000 bulbs a day. They suffered this tying up to the bed simply because they failed to meet their daily production quota in the Chinese labor camp. Li has, been in pri has seen imprisoned Christians treated so badly that their buttocks bleed through their clothing. He spent 15 days in prison on this particular occasion. Yet rather than this experience teaching him to be afraid, it has taught him to be prepared. He travels at all times with a small black duffel bag that he keeps packed with a blanket and a change of clothes and things he will need for prison the next time he is arrested. He has said arrest will come at any time, but I'm, we are not afraid, for we have prepared ourselves he says, we have done no crime. Whenever possible, he will spend time in prison reading a small Bible, something he manages to smuggle in with amazing regularity. His wife strongly supports him, and she refuses to worry, saying God will take care of him. There is no need to worry. Chinese officials in 2000 confiscated Lee's church and welded the door shut. In early November, in the city they repeatedly blew up and demolished at least 450 churches, temples, and shrines. So, I mean, this is 24 years ago this happened, but it's still happening to this day. Christians in some countries are being persecuted. However, because we have the freedom to gather and worship, and because we, we do not have to deal with that kind of situation... It doesn't mean that there's, there's not a message in Peter's letter for us. 
We just have to dig a little deeper to understand what Peter is teaching. And so let's do that this morning. In verses 13 to 17, Peter is urging his readers to make, <coughs> to make a positive use of all their opportunities. He's saying if you have an opportunity to witness to Christ and his mercy and to share this good news, he said do it, even if it means, even if it's while you're you know, suffering hostile situations. In the second part of his passage, if we were to keep reading, he backs up his teaching by referring to the suffering that Jesus suffered. But then he revels in the victory of Christ. But I want us to focus on the first part of Peter's message, the part about being prepared. Prepared. Fear, especially fear of physical pain, is a strong emotion for most of us. And although we are taught to call upon God and and we quote scripture for strength, things like, if the Lord is on our side, who can be against us? You know, if the Lord is my helper, whom shall I fear? Be strong and courageous. Those are all true. Those are all great. But they don't always drive away fear. And so we, we tend to give in to that fear. Peter didn't need to warn his readers that they might suffer for being Christians. They were already experiencing it. And many had to have been thinking, what else can I expect if I become a Christian? Is this what it is, and is it really worth it? And some of these people were leaving the faith. They were denouncing the faith. And so Peter, he writes to them <coughs> to encourage them. Um, and, he, and he kind of answers their question, what does it mean to be a Christian in these days? And in verse 13, Peter says, Who's going to harm you? Who's going to harm you if you are eager to do good? How many of you have ever really been punished for doing something good? Not really, not many, okay? It's usually the immoral people, the ones doing bad things, illegal things that get punished. But, you know, and, and we're to live differently. And, and Paul says, be eager to do good. Don't, don't just be willing to do it, but eagerly seek out different opportunities to do good. We shouldn't, you know, and he asks, who's going to harm you if you do good? I think sometimes we think only Christians can be good people, but there are good Muslims, good Buddhists, good Hindus, good atheists. They may not be saved, but they're good people. They live good, and good Goodness is something that is recognized worldwide. And as a general rule of thumb, no one punishes someone for doing good. However, rules can be broken by those who wish to do so. They will find any reason to take your good and twist that. And therefore, doing good in certain circumstances can lead to, to violence and suffering. The Christian standard of goodness and right living may not be accepted in other places in the world. For example, we Christians believe that all people are of equal worth and in the eyes of God and have equal rights and, and, and freedoms. However, during the early 1800s, hundreds, the selling of slaves in Africa was a huge business. The tiny island of Zanzibar was the slave trade capital of the, of the world, and they, they would send out 60 to 100,000 slaves a year to India, to China, and to America. The slave owners and the people running this business they, and the people buying the slaves believed that these people were animals, that they didn't have a soul, so they were things, they were property to be bought and traded. However, there were Christians, Christian missionaries in Africa, like David Livingston from Britain, who, who, who pushed to abolish slavery. He wanted to end it. He wanted to do good, get rid of this evil. How do you think he was met by, by the folks in the slave trade? Not well. He was being, and he got attacked, and he was punished for doing good. Those in Peter's day were no different. There were those who, didn't, who did not want the Christian standard. And they resisted it. And they tried to get rid of the Christians. 
by, by making them suffer and persecuting them. So when people do react violently or aversely to the Christian moral standard, what do we do? Well, Peter tells them in verse 14, do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. For even if you should suffer for doing good, you are blessed. Peter says that if you are punished for doing what is right, you will be blessed. Do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew 5.10 in the Beatitudes? He said, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. You are blessed if you are persecuted for doing what is right. Peter's encouraging them and us to, by pointing out that after the suffering, if, if you do suffer, God's going to honor that. If you do it in his name, if this is happening because of him, that he will honor that. And that the current suffering outweighs, or the, the, that blessing will outweigh the current suffering. So we need to be conscious of this blessing that God has promised us. And if we believe in that promise, then it helps us, helps us to endure persecution and to see it in a different light. We don't have to like it, but we can endure it and get through it. So Peter acknowledges that being a Christian can have a negative, there can be a negative part to that. But now in verse 15, he switches to a more positive outlook. Instead of fearing what others might do, he offers several pieces of advice. He begins by saying, in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. One aspect of making Christ our Lord is being obedient, developing this inward attitude of obedience. This attitude of obedience helps determine how we live our lives and how we respond to, to things that happen to us. And, you know, and, and it helps us to live out our Christian walk outside of these four walls in the world out there. I, I'm always, it's interesting to see how people, you know, uh, act in different situations and in different places. People's attitude change, their, their language changes. You know, when they step onto a soccer field or a football field or a basketball court or they step into the business place or whatever, their attitudes or language will change. However, when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, we're to strive to be like him all the time. Our lifestyle out there shouldn't be different from what it is in here. As Christians, we shouldn't act in any way that will bring dishonor to Christ. And that includes in our times of suffering. It includes when people are persecuting us. It includes when people are doing wrong to us. We are still to act like Christ. So we are to, in our hearts, set Christ apart as our Lord and act like him. And then the second piece of advice he gives is that we should always be ready to give a witness to our faith for what we believe. He says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Peter uses the word hope as a synonym for faith because it looks forward to future expectations. It looks forward to that blessedness. You see, there will be times when we will be directly challenged and directly asked, why, do you, why are you a Christian? What do you believe? The idea that we should always be ready to explain what we believe is what Peter's getting at. And it's, it's interesting how many times I personally have asked people, so tell me, tell me about your faith journey. Tell me what you believe and why. And I, people often struggle to put it into words. They say, I know what I believe, but I don't, know how to, I don't know how to tell you. I don't know how to explain it. And perhaps some of you can relate to that. If I were to point to someone right now and say, please come up here and share what you believe. You might struggle to put words to that. And, and I believe that one of the main reasons we struggle with 
explaining our faith is because we haven't prepared to do it. We are not prepared to give a reason for why we believe. And ironically, I think that's especially true for those of us who grew up in the church. We've been around it our whole lives, and we don't really think about it. We're just doing it. And the people we love, they're doing it with us. I know when I, when I lived back home before I got into ministry, I knew all those roads. I, I could take you on every back road, every mountain road, every logging road to get you through somewhere. But if someone asked me, I remember one time they asked me, hey, can you give me directions? And I was like, well, sure. But I couldn't remember route numbers. I couldn't remember the, the name of the road. I could say, now go up two miles up here and at this store turn right. But I couldn't remember, what is the name of that route number? Because I never thought about it. I just did it. And I knew where I was going. And I think sometimes with our faith, it's, it can be the same. We do faith but we're not thinking about it. And so when someone asked us about it, we can, we can struggle to put words to what do you believe and why. And, the, and so um, I want to offer you some advice on how to prepare to share your faith. Studies have proven over and over again that if you write something down, it will become real to you. Write it down. So I suggest that you write out a statement of faith, not a big, long treatise, just a short paragraph of this is what I believe and why, and then read it out loud. Read it out loud so you can hear your own voice saying what you're, what you're feeling, and then memorize that. Memorize it. Then when someone says, what do you believe? You are ready to give an answer. You are prepared in that moment. You see, when someone asks you, who they know to be a Christian, what you believe, and you flinch, you can't give them a real answer, they walk away believing your faith is hollow. They're like, they don't even know what they believe, so why should I believe it? And so it's very important for us to believe and have an answer and, and to understand why we believe what we believe. Now, sometimes we know what we believe, but fear, going back to fear, that strong emotion, can cause us to withhold that. Another story in this book is about a young boy named Kim. And Kim came home one day, and he was pale, he was crying, and he was he was shaking, and his mother said, Kim, what's wrong? Kim lives in North Korea. Kim is from North Korea. His mother said, what's wrong? And he said, Mom, we were coming home from school, and two Korean police officers stopped us, and they threw my friend to the ground, and they were asking him questions of who he was and where he was from and where he was going, and and, and he didn't say anything. He didn't fight back. He didn't yell. He simply looked at me because he, he wanted me to believe what he believed. And he said, bless them. And mom, they shot him right there. And her mother, his mother started to weep. And she said, I understand. He said, how can you understand? He said, I don't even know what a Christian is. She said, I understand because I am one. But I was afraid to tell you. I was afraid to tell you that I believed in the Lord because of that. But then she proceeded to talk about the virgin birth and Jesus' teachings and his, his crucifixion, death, and resurrection. And as the afternoon passed, Kim gave his life to Jesus. But then he began to weep. And she said, what's wrong? He said, my brothers don't know. And so when the brothers came home, they all sat down. And in the wee hours of the morning, they all became believers in Jesus. And then their mother began asking around very quietly and, and secretly if anyone had a Bible in the Korean language so that her sons could now learn the teachings of this, this God, this Jesus, that they put their faith in. And not finding any, Kim crossed into China. 
And he was so happy when he found a small Korean Bible. And he asked, I need, are there more? And they said, we don't have any more. He said, I need 5,000. He said, I'll be back in a month. And Chinese Christians printed off 5,000 Korean Bibles. And over the next year, Kim and his brothers made multiple trips, dangerous trips, across the border from North Korea into China, smuggling Bibles back and forth. This is happening today. You see, because of fear and persecution, Kim's mother did not share her faith with her son. She kept it back. But when she saw his suffering, she was ready. She was ready to give testimony. She was prepared. This is what I believe and why. Now, in general, as human beings, I don't think we like to be challenged. I don't think we really like to be questioned, and especially if it's harshly. And often, you know, that you know, that turns, we get defensive and our voices can raise, we can get angry. But Peter's third piece of advice when answering questions about our faith, when challenged about what do we believe, he says, do it with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior and Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Our purpose for answering the questions isn't necessarily to defend the faith. It's simply to share this truth with those who are asking in the hopes that they will receive it and they too would come to know Christ. But if we get defensive, if we get loud, if we are disrespectful, then the walls go up and the ears go shut. A gentle response should be the characteristic of all Christian life. By doing so, we keep a clean conscience, knowing we have done nothing wrong. Peter is saying that our attitude towards persecution and questioning should make those who are doing it ask questions about us and about what they're doing. Do you remember when Jesus stood before Pilate? How did he act? What were his actions? He remained gentle. He remained respectful. He remained humble. And Pilate was confused. He's like, wait a minute. This is the guy who supposedly stirred up riots and and public disturbances? I don't get it. You see, because Jesus remained gentle and respectful, Pilate could find nothing wrong with him. And those outside, the chief priests, they were the one that the shame was coming on. You guys appear to be lying, making things up, because I'm not seeing it. But had Jesus been loud, had he been disrespectful and combative, Pilate would have never even struggled with who Jesus was. He would have signed his death certificate immediately. Now, although Pilate was not changed by his encounter with Christ, others were. I mean, after seeing, witnessing Jesus' suffering on the cross and his gentleness, his humbleness, his forgiveness for those who were persecuting him, killing him, the Roman centurion said, surely this man is the Son of God. No one else could, do, could, re, could, could react like this. Surely this man is the Son of God. In the same way, it is the hope that our attitude and lifestyle of gentleness and humility and respect will lead those around us to the same conclusion, that these people are not like me. They're not like anyone else I've ever met. They call themselves children of God. Maybe there is something to this God thing, and hopefully they check that out. Then in verse 17, Peter concludes this part of his letter by making the point that it is better to do good and suffer punishment from men than it is to do evil and experience the wrath of God. It's very similar to Matthew 10, 28. Do not fear men who can kill the body but cannot fear kill the soul, but rather fear God who can kill both body and soul. Again, few if any of us in this room have ever suffered that type of treatment for being a Christian. 
and therefore it's hard for us to understand. And there are some people who don't even believe it's happening. For many, martyrdom was just something that happened in the first 200 years of the church. But let me assure you, it is very real today as it was then. I mean, most of us know of the Holocaust and that 5 million Jews died. But did you also know 1 million Christians died in the Holocaust? According to Fox's Book of Martyrs, during Joseph Stalin, Stalin's reign in Russia, in 1937, 85,000 clergy were killed. In 1938, 21,500 clergy were killed. In 1939, 900 clergy were killed. Between 1917 and 1980, one million German Lutherans and 200,000 German clergy were executed in communist Russia. According to Fox's Book of Martyrs, between 33 AD and 96 AD, the first 63 years of the Christian church, 18,000 Christians were put to death during the worst of the Roman persecutions. However, in the last 70 years, over 13 million Christians have, been, have lost their lives around the world simply proclaiming Christ as their Lord and Savior. And you know where Christianity is spreading the fastest? In many of those places where persecution is high. But we live in a country where it is permissible to worship and spread the good news. So what are we afraid of? Reverend Zai, a Chinese pastor, said this, Don't feel sorry for us. At least we are constantly reminded that we are in spiritual warfare. We know who we are fighting, and we are fighting the good fight. We know who the enemy is. Perhaps we should pray for you Christians outside of China. In your leisure, in your affluence, in your freedom, sometimes you no longer realize that you are in spiritual warfare. And that's what it is. It's spiritual warfare. Satan uses our blessing, our blessing of freedom, to blind us to the truth that persecution is real and it's going on around the world. Because we don't witness it, because we don't experience it, it's easy for us to dismiss it. But let me assure you that there are those, if, if they could have their way, if they could conquer this, this nation, they would get rid of your faith. And if you tried to practice it, they would persecute you for it. And I don't say that to create fear, but to point out to you that we are blessed in this country. Never take that for granted. Never take a Sunday morning worship for granted. We have the best possible situation in the world to share the message of God. So why aren't we? Why don't we? And I don't believe it's because we're afraid, but I think it's because we're not prepared to. We're not prepared. I ask someone, you know, I can ask someone, will you be a Sunday school teacher? And they're like, oh, I could never do that. Why? I don't know enough. Why don't you know enough? You're older than I am. You've sat through more Sunday school classes than I've ever been in. You've, you've listened to more sermons than I've ever preached. You have more experience in the church than I have. Why aren't you? Because they're not prepared. They're not prepared. They haven't really thought out this stuff. Here in America, many of us are prepared to defend this country. And if you ask us why we're proud to be an American, we'll tell you right away. But are you also just as prepared to defend your faith and are you prepared to give a reason for why you believe what you believe? My friends, I encourage you to think about what is it exactly you believe and why. Write it down, read it out loud, memorize it, and develop a gentle and respectful attitude toward all people, but especially those who question you and maybe cause you suffering. The psalmist said, Come listen, all of you. 
let me tell you. Let me tell you what he has done for me. He says, come all of you. Let me tell you about God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. And that's what we should be doing. But we have to be prepared to tell people what God has done for us. We have to be prepared to say why we believe what we believe. Amen. I invite you to stand and join us in our closing hymn. It's found on page 163 in the hymnal. 163. Children of God, I encourage you to go forth, prepare yourselves, think about what do I believe and why. And then when someone says, what do you believe? Say, let me tell you about my Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Go in peace and lovingly serve one another.